صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيد الممجد بشير المصدق المستفى الأمجد محمود الأحمد أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعسومين ولعن الله على الظالمين من الأولين والآخرين أما بعد فقال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم شرع لكم من الدين ما وصى به نوحا والذي أوحينا إليك وما وصينا به إبراهيم وموسى وعيسى أن أقيموا الدين ولا تتفرقوا فيه آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم سلوا على محمد وآل محمد Most of our age, Imam Al-Mahdi alayhi salam, my respected elders, brothers and sisters, salamun alaykum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Our discussion on the commentary of Ziyarat al-Waritha has reached where we are going to discuss the line, As-salamu alayka ya waritha, ya waritha Musa kalimillah. Peace and blessings be upon you, O the inheritor of Musa, who was the one who had express and direct conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yesterday, we looked at the story and looked at the relationship between Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam and Aba Abdullah al Hussein salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi. And we stated that Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam was the father of monotheism. And in the same way, Aba Abdullah alayhi salam is known as Abu Ahrar, who is the father of all those who are absolutely free. And therefore there is a relationship between them both because they both sought to seek to remove the internal idols that are created within the heart. And we found that Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, his struggle to his community was between monotheism and polytheism, tawheed and shirk. And we stated that there is more to polytheism than just attributing literally one idol to the belief system. Rather, polytheism is within the heart any particular belief, any particular love for anything which stops your growth and thus is a debilitating disease within the soul. Thus, if I take my low desires, or I take my enmity, or I take my hatred, or my arrogance, or any particular sin, and place it between me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that really becomes my God, because I actually end up worshipping that thing. And thus, that is the darkness of shirk, because it ends up constricting my heart, and stopping any genuine growth. The opposite of this is absolute tawheed, which thus is the opposite of restriction. It is constant growth, elaboration, direction, and constant evolution of the self until a point of completion. And thus Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam externally and internally sought to show us how to understand tawheed and how to remove the idols that we create from within us. And of course, on the 10th of Muharram, the master of the martyrs sought to do the same thing. In that, through examples like his Da'a al-Arafah. For example, in the way in which he even addressed his enemies on the 10th of Muharram, where he said on the battlefield, if you have no religion, and you do not fear the punishment of the hereafter, at least be free people within yourselves. I can't force you to believe in something, but don't do the inner shirk within your heart. 
Don't place wealth and life and zina and all these things as your gods. Be free individuals. Look at things rationally. Judge what Yazid is saying. Judge what Umar ibn Sa'd is saying. And you will break yourselves from these things which are strangleholds upon yourself. And thus, of course, we stated we need to break those strangleholds that are upon our heart, that are ultimately the shirk that we particularly follow. And tonight being the commentary of Prophet Musa alayhi salam, we again can divide his period into two. If you recall two nights ago when we spoke about Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, we said that the life of Nuh alayhi salam is divided into two major incidents. The first is his calling towards his people, and the second is the great flood that took place. And in the same way, we divide the story of Musa alayhi salam into two. The first is in regards to Fir'aun, and the second is post Fir'aun and his life and association with the community he tried to save, Banu Israel. And in regards to the first, it becomes very obvious as to how there is a link between Musa alayhi salam and the master of the martyrs. In that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Musa alayhi salam to Fir'aun. And of course, Aba Abdullah alayhi salam went to the greatest Fir'aun of all times, being Yazid. We'll come back to this, but of course there is much more to this particular relationship than just these two particular issues. In regards to the story of Musa alayhi salam, we find that the story of Fir'aun, of course, starts with his birth and the age of Musa alayhi salam and his coming into the world. The story of Fir'aun was one of which, where he took severe advantage of the circumstances, whereby, according to the Holy Quran, the level of oppression that he meted out against the people of Banu Israel is amongst the highest level for us to understand. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes and says, and recall when you, Banu Israel, were under the clutches of Fir'aun, and he subjected you to severe torment. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using a very unique way because how often do you find within the Holy Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually describing the situation of a community in that way. Remember, recall Banu Israel when you, your forefathers were subjected to Fir'aun at such a level of torment. What did they do? They used to kill your sons and spare your women. And this was a great trial from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we know, Fir'aun was told that the savior of Banu Israel were going to come and as such this baby boy should not be born into this community. And so every odd year he used to kill all the male that were born within the community. On that year, Eventually, Musa alayhi salam was born, and as we know, his mother put him into the river Nile, and eventually he ended up into the palace of Fir'aun. And as we know, Lady Asiya sallallahu alayha took the child in, fell in love with this child, and in the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Musa alayhi salam grew up under the watchful gaze of Fir'aun, despite him not knowing who it was. Of course, as we know, as the story moves on, he is forced to flee because of the incident where an accident takes place and the killing of an individual. He goes and eventually he meets with Prophet Shu'aib alayhi salam who ends up becoming his father-in-law. He ends up serving there for a number of years and eventually he is told to return back to Fir'aun and to bring the truth towards Fir'aun. What we want to focus on very much is the story of Banu Israel and what happens post Banu Israel, and how this has a direct association to the master of the martyrs. Because it's very obvious for us to be able to link Fir'aun and Yazid being two tyrants of their time. In fact, there is a great Sunni scholar, a great Sunni historian by the name of Mas'udi, where he writes about Yazid as to what level of a Fir'aun he really was. He talks about the history and he says Yazid was someone who used to play in his palace 
with monkeys, dogs and leopards. After the killing of Aba Abdullah alayhi salam, Ibn Ziyad comes to the palace and they celebrate together drinking cup after cup after cup of wine. This is not me. This is a great Sunni scholar, Al Mas'udi, very famous, describing what took place. Then he says, Fir'aun and Yazid have similarities between each other. Nay, this is his word, nay, actually, Fir'aun treated his community better than Yazid treated his community. Yazid is a far worse Fir'aun than Fir'aun was. If this is the opinion of generally the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah community, one can very quickly imagine that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was so displeased with someone like Fir'aun and the Sunni ulama and Mu'akhireen and the Sunni scholars will say that this individual was worse than Fir'aun, you can only begin to imagine what Yazid was really like. In fact, there's a very famous line of poetry that puts these two constantly together. It says that for every Fir'aun there must be a Musa. And thus for every Yazid there must be a Hussein. Which is so beautiful because even in the 21st century you have many Fir'auns that are alive today. The name isn't important. Fir'aun, Yazid, Muawiyah, they're all the same by virtue of characteristics. And thus, be you Musa, or be you Hussein, or you be anyone who stands up against the Fir'aun of today, you begin to embody Hussein ibn Ali alayhi salam into yourself. What an honor. What an honor when you and I, instead of embodying Fir'aun, we embody Hussein ibn Ali. And it's very important for us to realize this particular fact that you and I have a potential to impact our own communities. Many of us sometimes come to the masjid, to the Imam Barqa, and we consider ourselves as individuals that we don't have any power, any sway, any ability to change the circumstance, to make a better circumstance in our community. Alhamdulillah, things are very good. We are flourishing. We have our majalis. We have Ahlul Bayt and Quran. We are generally very good people. But that doesn't mean the community can't continue to improve. Our problem sometimes is that we come to the community and think of myself as one individual. The first response about this, because we say, I'm only one person, I can't make a change. The first thing to remember is to go back to that story of the small frog and the story of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. As we described yesterday, that the fire was so heavy in its burning, so ferocious in its heat, that those that made it, they said that their faces became black from the smoke. They weren't even standing so close. That's how much smog came from it. Of course, the famous story of the frog was that he takes a little bit of water and he comes as close as he can in order to put the fire out. Now you can imagine if the human beings that actually built the fire couldn't even come close to the fire, imagine how far away the frog was from the fire. When he would spit at the fire to try to put it out, he wouldn't even have reached the fire. The water wouldn't even have reached the fire. So when he returned, the rest of his community said, why did you bother? He said, no, at least I could show to my Lord I tried to do my bit for my community. At least I tried to do my bit for Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. In the same way, our little bit is firstly in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't consider yourself as just an individual. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala backs you, who is going to stop you? And if he decides to not go with you, who in the world can make you successful? One person does make a difference within a community. Number two, there is a wonderful hadith about Amr bil Ma'roof wa Nahi anil Munkar, which comes from Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. In which he says, the world is like a ship. The world is like a ship. And the inhabitants of this world are like the ship's crew. 
You know the ship has its crew and its passengers. Everyone who's on board the ship. The world is like a ship. And its inhabitants are like the crew on the ship. If there is a leak in the ship, it is the responsibility of everyone within the ship to plug the hole, lest the ship sinks. Imagine now, we are on the ship, all of us here. If there was a leak there, all of us would rush to go and plug that hole, wouldn't we? Because we would all take it as our personal responsibility to ensure that the leak doesn't sink us. Our problem is that when the world is ablaze, when there are problems within our community, too many of us stay silent and don't stand and plug the hole. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messenger said that this world will sink like the ship will sink if we don't end up standing against oppression, if we don't stand up doing our amr bil ma'roof wa nahi and in munkar. So simple. And therefore, in fact, again, the Holy Prophet of Islam has a wonderful narration to inspire you as to our outcome from being able to do Amr bil ma'roof wa nahi and al munkar. As the commander of the faithful is sent and deputed to the area of Yemen, before the event of Ghadir, Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam was sent to the whole country of Yemen in order to bring them towards Islam. As he is about to leave, Rasulullah gives to him some pieces of advice. Amongst them he says, when you go, don't dispute with people. When you go, bring them with goodness and tell them about the benefits that are blessed and bestowed upon mu'mineen. And three, remember, Ya Ali, that if one person is guided through you, it is better for you than everything that lies underneath these skies. Subhanallah. Gold, silver, diamonds, oil. Is there anything more than oil today in terms of value? Countries are invaded on the basis of oil today. Everything that lies underneath these skies, it's worth less than if you guide one person towards haqq. Amr bil ma'roof wa nahi and al munkar. Today, there are many Fir'auns in different guises, many Yazids in different guises. Our problem has been that we become silent on them. We don't forward even emails. We don't even forward text messages. Sometimes we actually side with the Yazid. Sometimes we actually partake with them. For example, we know that the state of Israel, the illegal and illegitimate state of Israel, is killing people. Whether it kills an innocent Palestinian or it funds to kill an innocent Pakistani or an innocent Syrian or an innocent person from Lebanon, the realm is not confined to just the issue of Palestine, is it? We're talking about a global entity, aren't we, of Zionism. Yet there are people who will still purchase and still buy goods and promote the buying of goods which directly sponsor the state of Israel. We actually side with the Yazids of the 21st century. And then we come to the Majlis and cry over Hussein ibn Ali. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Here we have to realize our basic responsibilities. The story of Hussein ibn Ali is not for the battlefield on the 10th of Muharram. It is for here in our hearts every single day. Thus the Yazids and the Fir'auns that live today, whomsoever they are, our responsibility is to act and do something. Sit and talk. Discuss, debate, try to bring people closer to one another through love, through mutual respect and relationships. And through these ways, inshaAllah, we will be able to really perform the basics of Amr bil Ma'roof, Wan Nahi, and Al Munkar. The beauty of this particular issue is that in the farewell speech and mission statement of the Master of the Martyrs, he himself said, Inni lam akhruj ashiran. How am I going to achieve my reformation, my, re my revolution? He didn't say through the sword, through the arrow, through abuse. He said, Amr bil ma'roof wa nahi an al munkar. Simple basic things of us calling each other towards good and faith 
and ignoring and stopping the evils that we see within our community. And thus the story as to why, Ibrahim, why Musa alayhi salam is named as being the warith of, or why Aba Abdullah alayhi salam is named as being the warith of Musa alayhi salam is because of what happened with Rabbanu Israel as much as what happened with Fir'aun. As we stated, it's easy for us to talk about Fir'aun and Yazid. That's obvious to us. However, it is more so to do with Banu Israel as a community and what Hussein ibn Ali went through in regards to his own community. The parallels between these two communities, Banu Israel and the people at the time of Aba Abdullah Hussein alayhi salam, they were exactly the same. What happened? The first thing is for us to realize the Quran has many layers to it. According to one hadith, there are 70 layers to every verse of the Holy Quran. According to another, there are 70,000 layers to every verse of Quran. 70,000 is a figurative number. It doesn't mean literally there are 70,000 layers to each verse. It means there are an unending amount of layers to the Holy Quran. Meaning that any one verse can be seen through a number of angles. If I look at it in light of history, I'll get one view. If I look at the same verse in light of philosophy, I'll look at another view. If I look at it in light of science, I'll look at it in another view. And so on and so forth. Part of these verses have to be explained by Ahlul Bayt for us to understand the principles of these verses and how to extract the ta'wil of these verses. Ta'wil, it can be different and difficult for us to translate the word ta'wil into English. But there might be one or two different ways to understand ta'wil. Number one, ta'wil can be a hidden meaning which is only known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ahlul Bayt, and those people whom Ahlul Bayt have vested with knowledge of ta'wil. One. Two, the ta'wil may be the true meaning of a verse at that particular time, at that particular scenario, at that particular incident, at that particular era. Very specific. Which means the ta'wil can change. At one time, the ta'wil of a verse is X. But as an era changes, and as the verse needs to realign itself and re-manifest itself, another ta'wil can be taken from it. Again, the requirement of who has knowledge of ta'wil goes back to the previous three. It must be from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It must be from Ahlul Bayt salamu alayhi alayhi majma'een. And it must be from someone whom Ahlul Bayt have actually taught the ta'wil of. Two, the third meaning of ta'wil is the one we're going to talk about now and try to understand. Ta'wil may also mean in the English language, typology. Typology, T-Y-P-O-L-O-G-Y, typology. We have styles of tafsir, styles of tafsir, correct? There are methodologies of tafsir, they're not all the same. That's why we have various different tafsir, they're not necessarily opposing each other, they're looking at things from a different angle. As an example, the most common way to do tafsir historically was a chronological way. Start with the first verse, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Second verse, Alhamdulillah, Rabbal Alameen. And so on and so forth, one by one by one, until the very last verse. Chronological. Or for example, you can look at the Holy Quran through language. For example, the famous scholar, Zamakhshiri, was someone who performed the commentary and the exposition of Quran, specifically through language, trying to understand the roots of words, how words are connected with each other, the synonyms of certain words, the grammar of the Holy Quran. This is a style of commentary within itself. Then you have another style. As an example, you have the one which was made famous by His Eminence, Allama Sayyid Muhammad Hussain Taba Tabai, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, whereby he takes a verse and tries to, be, tries to take the other verses of Quran to explain it. It's called Tafsir al Quran Bil Quran. Quran by Quran, that you take a verse and explain it through another verse or another set of verses. This is one of the most profound ways of looking at the Holy Quran. Another way of looking at the Holy Quran is called thematic. 
tafsil al mawdu'i meaning you take one topic within the holy quran and you bring all the verses of those particular topics and you see how a jigsaw puzzle when put together beholds an entire picture in itself for example if i want to understand imam al mahdi alayhi salam i don't just look at one verse do i that won't give me the entirety of him his beginning his mission his prophecies how things will end in the world i need the entirety of the set of verses in the quran in order to understand that that is called mawdu'i tafsir another type of tafsir is called relational tafsir where you take two topics and try to merge them together to see how they meet and what relationship they have with each other as an example community and taqwa two separate topics right how to deal with social issues how to deal with the community and then you have taqwa now the reality is these two things shouldn't be separated for me to see how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants me to deal with them i have to bring the two of them together to understand it this is another type of tafsir the type of tafsir we want to mention in regards to banu israil and imam hussein alayhi salam is called typological commentary typology what does this mean it means a verse in the holy quran prefigures and let an event yet to come a verse of quran is there but the reality of that verse is that it will be manifested at a later time let me give you a very simple example one that you all know of and you'll be able to understand typological reasoning very simply in the story of ibrahim and ismail alayhi salam in surah safat allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and he describes the whole incident he says that ibrahim alayhi salam comes to his son ismail alayhi salam oh my dear son it is as if that i am seeing that i am slaughtering you what is your opinion about this particular incident ismail alayhi salam famously responds do as you have commanded insha allah you will find me amongst the patient ones and thus when he comes to slaughter ismail alayhi salam allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we ransomed your sacrifice for a later generation bidhibin azim now we know that on the 10th of muharram the incident that manifests that story is in regards to ali ibn al-asghar alayhi salam aba abdullah alayhi salam takes ali ibn al-asghar he presents him towards the enemies he says if you think i have done any wrong to you then so be it but tell me what has this child done wrong to you and then the evil hormara places a three pronged arrow into his bow and shoots it into the neck of ali ibn al-asghar at that point we realize that the sacrifice that was ransomed to the latter generation is of course aba abdullah alayhi salam this is called typological tafsir where a verse is present but it manifests itself later on it is prefiguring an event that is due to take place later on why is this important in regards to musa alayhi salam and banu israil why is this important to aba abdullah alayhi salam the reason is that the verses about banu israil are typologically used and prefigure the events of banu umayyah whenever you see a verse in the holy quran about banu israil you will normally be able to find it actually having a manifestation in regards to banu umayyah and thus all the trials and tribulations that Musa alayhi salam had with Banu Israil they later manifested themselves in Banu Umayyah at the time of Ahl al-Bayt sallallahu alayhi wa ajma'in let me give you a few examples from tafsir and then we'll show you in Quran how this worked and how this affected the master of the martyrs we have many many tafsir from Ahl al-Bayt saying this incident about Banu Israil is about banu umayyah as an example in surah ash-shams allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says was shamsi wa duhaha wal qamari idha talaha wan nahari idha jallaha wal layli idha 
yakhshaha. Someone came, a companion came to the third Imam, Aba Abdullah al Hussein sallallahu wa sallam hu and said to him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, what is the meaning of these verses? Washamsi wa duhaha. The Imam responded and said, Shams refers to my grandfather Rasulullah. Walqamari idha talaha. And the moon that follows the sun refers to my father Ali ibn Abi Talib. Walnahari idha jallaha. And the day that will come is referring to my great-grandson Mahdi when he will bring about the light during the day. And in regards to Layl, which covers the darkness, the night which covers, refers to Banu Umayyah. Subhanallah. Look within Quran. What is being stated? That the night, darkness. What is darkness, metaphorically speaking? When we say, Ula'ika, we take... Mina dhulamati ila nur. We are saying that there are those people who are taken out of darkness, disbelief, misguidance, treachery, taken into nur, into guidance. And then there are the opposites who take from nur ila dhulamat. There are those people who take you out of guidance into darkness. Darkness means what? It means disobedience to God. It means absolute rejection of God. Here, the third Imam, in his wondrous tafsir, stated that the darkness that covers in the Ummah is actually Banu Umayyah. It makes us really think, doesn't it, as to how Ahlul Bayt spoke about them. Another hadith, is ver- another hadith is very interesting about another verse of the Holy Qur'an. And this one comes to us from our sixth Imam, Ja'far al-Sadiq, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi. In Surah Al-Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 4 and verse number 5, the verse says, وَقَذَيْنَا إِلَىٰ بَنُوا Israel." We have decreed for Banu Israel, لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَّتَيْنِ وَلَتَعْلُنَّ أُلُوًّا كَبِيرًا That we have ordained and decreed in the book, we have stated that it's going to happen, that Banu Israel will cause two major mischiefs in their time. And that this is bound to happen. This promise from us is bound to happen. It is going to happen. Here, the sixth Imam stated that in regards to this, the ta'wil, the typological meaning of this verse was through Banu Umayyah. How so? He says the first great mischief that they're going to do is to kill Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. And the second great mischief that is going to take place by Banu Israel, by Banu Umayyah, is killing Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam. Imagine when Imams talk in these ways, and how we read the Qur'an, and how there's layer after layer after layer of meaning available for us to take from the Qur'an. It shows us the potential of Banu Umayyah. And there are many verses that we could give to you. In fact, there are many traditions about this one verse, about this verse that Banu Israel are going to make mischief twice in the community, that this is specifically about Banu Umayyah. It makes you wonder what two great mischiefs were to take place. And thus, whenever we read verses about Banu Israel, we are able to see how it directly links to Banu Umayyah, and thus how it will directly link to the story of Aba Abdullah alayhi salam. As an example, in Surah Al-Baqarah, we find so many verses dedicated to the story of Banu Israel. Take for example, verses 83 to 85. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala divides the treachery of Banu Israel at the time of Musa into three things. What were the three things? The first one was that they rejected the covenant that they made with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second was that they would kill their prophets. How many hundreds of prophets, thousands of prophets and messengers, divinely appointed guides were killed by Banu Israel, number two. And number three, they exchanged their book for a small price. They sold their soul for a small price. Whenever you see these three things, 
This is manifested in typological tafsir through Banu Umayyah. They did the same three things. Let us look at what Banu Israel did. And then you will see what Banu Umayyah did. The first one was that they did not uphold their covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What were the covenants that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made with Banu Israel? In Surah Al-Baqarah verse number 83, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lists them. The first one, you should not worship none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One, you must do good to your parents and to the nearest of kin. And you should look after the poor and the needy. You should uphold your prayer and pay the alms tax. But despite, this continues, the verse continues, despite you making this covenant with us, you did the opposite. You slayed people. You slayed your prophets. You sent your people out of their houses and exiled them. And then when you took them as captives, you actually tried to ransom them, even though you weren't even allowed to send them out of their houses in the first place. Look at the list of things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about to Banu Israel. Don't worship any other than Allah. Do good to your parents. Do good to your nearest of kins. Don't kill. And to the extent that when captives came to you, you actually tried to sell them off. Even though you weren't even allowed to take them and kill them in the first place. You will see here a direct correlation between Banu Israel and Banu Umayyah. In which way? The first thing is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, don't take anyone as a Lord except me. I don't even know where to begin with that one. How they took their own tribe as a Lord. They took their leaders as Lords. Yazid said something, they followed it. They became their gods. Muawiyah became their gods and so on and so forth. But when it came to the rest of the social contract between Banu Israel and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Banu Umayyah manifested it in the same way. The contract was, don't worship none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And do good to your parents. <laughs> Subhanallah. You know in the hadith, Rasulullah has a wonderful narration. He says, me and Ali, we are the two fathers of this nation. Me and Ali... We are the two fathers of this nation. When Banu Umayyah were told in this verse, do good to your parents, which parents were you told good to do towards? Which two parents? As soon as Rasulullah died, how did you react? How did you react towards Ali ibn Abi Talib? How did you react towards the family? Why? Because after it said do good to parents, it said do good to the nearest of kin. Who were the nearest of kin? If Rasulullah and Amir al muminin were the two fathers of the community, the parents of the community, who were the nearest of kin? Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein. How did they treat Imam al Hassan and how did they treat Imam al Hussein? The verse continued establish your salah and defray your zakah. The verse continued and said, Do not take each other out of your houses, do not slay your messengers. Subhanallah, how many times did they do this? Don't exile people. How did the greatest of companions of Ahlul Bayt die? How did they die? Expelled from their own houses. And then the verse continued, and when you take captives, you try to ransom them, even though you weren't even allowed to expel them in the first place. Subhanallah, you know, when Ahlul Bayt were taken in front of Yazid, do you know what he tried to do? He tried to sell the children of Ahlul Bayt as slaves. In one of the narrations, Yazid asks, Who are you all? And each one of the family members have to name themselves. One of the people from Rome, sitting in the court of Yazid, said, Ya Yazid, I want to buy this young girl as a slave of mine. Do you know who that girl was? Sakina bint al Hussein. Sakina bint al Hussein. I want to buy her as a slave. Sayyid Zainab sallallahu alayhi stood in front of Sakina and said, you have to go through me before you take this girl as a slave. The verse said, and when you take people as captives, you try to ransom them, sell them off, even though you weren't even allowed to take them out of their houses in the first place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala divided the treachery of Banu Israel into three. The first one was the covenant that they broke. 
The second is that you should not be killing your prophets. Subhanallah, Banu Umayyah slaughtered the household of Ahlul Bayt who were their own messengers and representatives from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third was that you should not take your book for a small price. Do not sell your book for a small price. Banu Israel sold their book for a small price. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says within the Holy Quran, وَيْلٌ لِلَّذِينَ يَكْتُبُونَ بِأَيْدِيهِمْ Woe be upon those people who write the book with their own hand. ثُمَّ يَقُولُونَ هَذَا مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ And then they say that this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That they sell it for a small price. Banu Israel did this and Banu Umayyah did this as well. There is an absolute likening between Banu Umayyah and Banu Israel in the Quran. Everything that they did, the other one did. This is typological reasoning. Here, we can clearly see why Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam is likened to Musa alayhi salam. Because Musa alayhi salam was given such problems from his own community, they rejected him. They went against him in everything that he said. In the same way, the majority of the community went against Aba Abdullah al Hussein in everything that he said. True or not? Remember the story of Banu Israel. As they are freed from the clutches of Fir'aun and the Red Sea, they enter into the land. Musa says, this is now your homeland. Enter into it and defeat the people therein. Remove them and you can have this land for yourself, correct? What was the response? What was the response from Banu Israel in the Holy Quran? You and your Lord Musa, go and we will sit here waiting for you. They were told, stand up and fight. They were told, go and do what you're supposed to do for your prophet. In the same way, the community of Aba Abdullah al Hussein actually went a step further. They called Hussein ibn Ali towards them in their thousands. And yet they sat and didn't help Aba Abdullah al Hussein. The same things of Banu Israel happened with Banu Umayyah and the Shia at that, the Shia at that time. Of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Indeed, wallah, assalamu alayka ya waritha Musa kalimillah. He really was the inheritor of Musa kalimillah. Because his own community went against him the same way the community went against Musa alayhi salam. Here, there needs to be a deeper lesson. Here, there needs to be a real understanding for you and I in the 21st century. Because it doesn't stop there. The Shia, the Shia, not Banu Umayyah, we finished. We did Fir'aun. It's obvious how Fir'aun is likened to Yazid. Now it's an understanding as how Banu Israel are likened to Banu Umayyah. We're going to look at a third aspect in these last five minutes. We're going to talk about the Shia now. The Shia of Aba Abdullah alayhi salam. And how they are likened to the issue of Banu Israel. There were around three different types of Shia at the time of Aba Abdullah alayhi salam. Three types. The first one were the true Shia in that if they were called, they would have given their head and did give their head. Mukhtar al-Thaqafi, Hani ibn Arwa, Muslim ibn Aqil, those companions that left Kufa and went to Karbala, those companions in Kufa who were jailed whilst the event of the 10th of Muharram took place, these were the true Shia, number one. The second type of Shia at the time were those people who cowered and were hypocritical. And they sold themselves for that small price. In that when they were commanded to go and raise themselves for the sake of Hussein ibn Ali alayhi salam, the moment someone like Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad said, we're going to kill you, we're going to ransack your property, we're going to plunder your house, they quivered. And they stopped and they didn't do anything for Hussein ibn Ali. Second type at the time of Aba Abdullah alayhi salam. The third type, most people don't know about and most people don't realize. The third type of Shia were the extremist Shia. Extremist Shia at the time of Hussein ibn Ali alayhi salam. Why? Because at the time of the sulh between Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam and Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, there were certain Shia that disliked peace and cooperation in the community. 
They disliked peace between sects. They disliked peace between two parties that disliked each other. You know what they would do? After Imam al Hassan alayhi salam made his peace treaty with Muawiyah, they disliked it. They wanted war with Muawiyah. They wanted to go and abuse. They wanted to go forward against Muawiyah. You know what they did? They went to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and they tried to create friction between the two brothers. You know what they said? Ya Hussein, your brother is wrong. Subhanallah. Your brother is wrong. He doesn't know. He needs to go out and fight Muawiyah. If you rise and raise a sword against Muawiyah, we will follow you and we will leave your brother. Subhanallah. How difficult it was for Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Extremist Shia that disliked peace and cooperation and working together for the greater goal. Today, you find exactly the same thing in the 21st century. You find extremist Shia that dislike, dislike any cooperation between sects. You dislike any working together between sects. What they prefer is war between sects. We had extremist Shia at the time of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. We have extremists today at the same time with Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam. Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam, as per all the dictates of Quran and all the dictates of Ahadith, would prefer peace, cooperation, love, coexistence for the better goal. Yet today, there are people who would go to Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam and say, let's cause fitna and friction between our brothers. The same way they did to Imam Hussain alayhi salam, if they could do it today, with Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam, they would do it. We need to realize how Ahl al-Bayt actually acted. The most difficult of things for Imam Hussain alayhi salam were his own Shia. Two-thirds of his Shia, in majority, did the opposite of what he begged them to do. In the same way today. The problem with the divisive Shia, the problem with those people who dislike unity, is that if not only they dislike unity between Shia and Sunni, they also dislike unity between Shia and Shia as well. They will try to create division between Shia and Shia as well. Why is Imam al Hussein alayhi salam called the warif of Musa alayhi salam? You all know the story of Musa alayhi salam in Khidr, yes? Musa in Khidr, you know the story? They went. And there were three major disagreements between Musa and Khidr. Correct or not? If I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong. There were three major differences between Musa and Khidr. Correct or not? What were the differences? The first one was in regards to the wall. Another one was in regards to the boat. A third one was in regards to killing an innocent child. These aren't small differences of opinion. We're talking about murder, aren't you? It's not a small difference of opinion. But the lesson is, two prophets of God differed with each other. Subhanallah. Two prophets, not any ordinary prophets. Musa alayhi salam, min ulul adam, one of the greatest prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, disagreed with another prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, is there anyone in this room, or any Shia around the world, that would point the finger and say, how dare two prophets of God differ with each other? I curse one prophet for his difference of opinion, for his difference of fatawa. Would anyone dare do this? Yet today, we have Shia amongst us, that when two marajit differ on any opinion, they have the audacity to create friction between two marajit. Worse still, they will even do la'na upon marajit today. True or not? Does it make sense to you? The Shia can see that two prophets of God differ with each other on jurisprudential opinions. 1200 years into Ghaybah, 1200 years into Ghaybah, of course we're going to have difference of opinion between Maraja on Fatawa. If two prophets of God can differ, how can two Maraja not differ with each other on a particular fatwa? But those Shia who actually give la'na upon marajit because of their dislike for, ta- for fatawa, they won't dare give la'na upon a prophet because of difference in fatawa. Look where we've arrived at today. 
the same issues that they faced then, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam's community faced today. Divisive people. Here we need to understand where we are. Really, we need to understand where we are. What do we say? Amr bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar. The pulpit is to do Amr bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar. We are obliged to understand the problems of the 21st century. There are Shia that will actually do this. Because they dislike and are so used to hatred between Shia Sunni, those same people want hatred between Shia and Shia. And they will create division between Marajah and Shia and Shia. The fact of the matter is, go home tonight. Go home tonight and read Bihal and Anwar. It's been translated into English if you don't read Arabic. Your fifth Imam, fifth Imam has a narration. Do not do la'na on a mu'min. Fifth Imam. Don't do la'na upon a mu'min. Yet, yet our own Shia today are giving la'na on marajah because of difference of opinion in fatawa. Which Shia are following their Imams? Today in the 21st century. Fatawa. It's so insignificant in the grand scheme of things. It's a fitty difference of opinion. Of course they're going to differ. You're brothers of each other, yet you can act in these ways with each other. The same extremist Shia that lived at the time of the third Imam, live today. No wonder he was called, Assalamu alayka ya waritha, Musa kalimillah. The same problems that Banu Israel gave to, her, to Musa alayhi salam, the Shia of Hussein ibn Ali alayhi salam are copying like for like, like for like. And we'll be getting worse day by day, day by day. Eventually we will do the same things as those people as well. If we don't stop it today. We need to think about where we are and how the trials are. And not just come and allow these things to happen every day in our societies so that the division becomes bigger and eventually we won't be able to bring ourselves back together. Assalamu alaikum ya waritha Musa kaleem Allah. Think about Hussein ibn Ali tonight and the level of trial that he had to go through and how it's manifesting itself today in the 21st century. Here, Musa alayhi salam was caused such difficulty by his community. Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam was caused such difficulty by his community. And Banu Umayyah killed Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. And they wouldn't even stop. They continued to even kill the children of Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. Instead of learning from their mistakes, they continued till the 10th of Muharram. Imam al Hassan alayhi salam, as he had been poisoned, our narrations say that he spat out a part of his own liver. And with a stick, he took and he turned that part of his liver over. He called his family to him and in his final words he looked at Aba Abdullah alayhi salam and addressed him and said Ya Aba Abdullah there is no day like your day Aba Abdullah I will not be there on the 10th of Muharram to assist you but in my stead I will give you Qasim and Abdullah my two precious sons I want them to go and fight. I want them to go out and be my representatives for you, Ya Aba Abdullah. Because I won't be there to aid you, O Aba Abdullah. The same question that his father, Ali ibn Abi Talib, posed to Aba Abdullah in the Battle of Safin. Ya Aba Abdullah, when this event takes place, how will you deal with it? I will bear patiently. Imam al Hassan alayhi salam asks the same thing. Oh, my dear brother, I will bear patiently on the 10th of Muharram. What does he mean patiently? He means patiently from the loss of those people who are closest to him. Those people who he loved the most, I will bear patiently during that trial and tribulation of giving those who are most beloved to me. After the martyrdom of Qasim, and the martyrdom of his dear son Ali al Akbar, the narration says, he brings the torn body of Qasim back towards the tent. He sits down between those two bodies 
He places his right hand upon the broken chest of his son Akbar. He places his hand upon the torn torso of Qasim. And he looks towards the sky and says, Ya Allah, bear witness my two sons have been taken from me at this time. That is what he meant when he said, I will bear patiently. Because the pain will be so much. This is how I will bear patiently on the 10th of Muharram. And as such, at that time, Qasim continues to come towards him and says, Oh my master, my uncle, please, Ya Amma, allow me to enter into the battlefield. Each time he would respond and said, No, I do not allow you to enter into the battlefield. Eventually, he comes towards his mother, Umm Farwa, and says, Oh my mother, Abba Abdullah will not allow me to enter into the battlefield. It is said that they take him into a tent which has a small chest and in this chest is a letter which is written from his brother Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam he takes it out and says O oh Qasim give this to your uncle and your uncle will not refuse you to enter into the battlefield he takes out that scroll and it is narrated to have said the same words that he said to him in his dying moments O oh my dear brother I will not be there to represent and help on the 10th of Muharram but please accept my sacrifices Qasim on this day imagine how painful this must have been for Hussein ibn Ali not because he received the letter not because he was about to give his Qasim but because it was reminding him of the same conversation that took place when his brother Hussein when his brother Hassan had been poisoned he must have remembered what it was like at that last moment to come and embrace his brother Hassan at that time and hearing that same dictate. And as such, he addresses Qasim and he sends him into the battlefield. Qasim enters and he recites lines of poetry. He says, Ana Qasim ibn al Hassan, I am Qasim ibn Hassan, Sibtun Nabi al Mustafa wal Mu'tamar. I am the grandson of Rasulullah. He comes towards the enemies. As they come, the one man is narrated to have said, This son, this person, his face is shining so beautifully like the slit of the new moon shines. As he begins to fight, he dispatches so many of the enemies towards the hellfire. One man turns towards the enemies in the camp and he says, I will strike a blow to this child so hard it will make his uncle Hussein cry so much. They turn to him and say, What do you want with this child? He is just a small child. Leave him alone. Why do you need to attack him? He says, No, I will attack him. It is said that he comes from behind. The coward doesn't even have the braveness to come and attack Qasim from the front. It is said, as Qasim is fighting so valiantly, the strap of his shoe breaks and he cannot stand so properly. For a moment, he stops in order to fix his sandal at this moment the enemy doesn't even have any mercy he comes with a mace from behind and strikes the head of Shah Qasim Qasim falls towards the floor he calls out Ya Amma Aghifni come to my aid oh my uncle come to my aid your beloved Qasim has been struck on the head as he falls towards the floor they strike him with spears they strike him with spears they strike him with daggers they do not leave the Qasim alone they do not leave him alone for even a minute but the worst tragedy is about to happen the tragedy of Qasim is not over at this moment Abba Abdullah and Abu Fadl Abbas come running out to come and meet their beloved Qasim the enemies are still in the battlefield they become so aware of what is happening they fear that the swords of Hussein and Abbas are about to strike them. They run this way and they run that. The horses run this way and runs that. As they come, Abbas and Hussein come running towards them. They begin to strike at the horsemen, sending them towards hell. But the horsemen in their fear and in their panic, they are running left and they are running right. Whose body is still there on the ground? Who is still alive? 
Qasim ibn al-Hassan is still alive. At this moment, the horsemen continue to plunder upon the body. We say to you, Qasim, when the horses trampled the body of Abba Abdullah, Abba Abdullah was dead. They had already severed his head from his body. Qasim, you were still alive when they trampled your body. It is said that eventually the dust settled. One narration says that Abba Abdullah looked towards the broken body of Qasim. Qasim was still kicking in pain. He was still kicking his feet against the ground. Hussein throws himself towards the body of Qasim. Qasim, go towards your grandfather. Oh Qasim, it kills your uncle Hussein that you called for him and he could not come to your aid in your final moment. Qasim, I am so sorry that I was not there for you in the final moments of your life. Abu Abdullah sits down by the body of Qasim. He begins to strike his head. He begins to cry. Eventually, he opens up his Abba. He puts it onto the ground. He picks up the broken body of Qasim and puts it into the Abba. He ties up the Abba and takes that body back towards the camp. Imagine the state of the body of the beloved of Hassan ibn Ali. He takes it back towards the camp. The women come out. What news do you have of our beloved Qasim? What news do you have of the beloved of the son of Hassan? Imagine how Zainab and Umm Kulthum are feeling. This is the son that reminds us of our brother Hassan, our protector. When our father was martyred, when our mother was martyred, Hassan was our protector. Now his son lies in the Abba of our brother. The Hussein. He takes that body back in towards the camp and places his hand upon that and upon the hand of Akbar and he looks towards the sky. Oh Allah, bear witness they have taken the two sons of Hussein ibn Ali. He doesn't stop there because it was a second son of Imam al Hassan who gave his life for Abu Abdullah and that was Abdullah ibn Hassan al Mushtaq.